So smoothed analysis is an approach to trying to understand the behavior of algorithms that Shonghua Tang and I, Shonghua is around here somewhere, developed a few years ago. We're both going to give talks here on smoothed analysis. I'm going to try to concentrate my talk on smoothed analysis of numerical algorithms. So I will begin by explaining our motivation for smoothed analysis, how we chose to define it, and then I'll show how it applies to a couple of algorithms. Okay, so one idea of how to define smooth analysis is to try to combine our ideas from information theory with algorithms. So in this view, we will think of problems as coming to us through some sort of noisy channel. So you might imagine there was some ideal problem out there that you wanted to solve. Say if you're in machine learning, you know, you're trying to get labels for something. But in reality, you make measurements and observations to get, say, all of your features, and these things might be a little bit noisy. I guess my notion of noise works better when those features are real numbers than discrete things. So I want to imagine this being small changes. And you might think of this as changing your observed problem. Similarly, if you are doing any sort of economic work or anything where there is or scientific algorithms, anything where there is measurement involved, in the formulation of your problem, then you can think of there being some ideal and there being some noise. And the problem you are actually observing has somehow been altered by this noise. Um, you can also think of just arbitrary decisions that were made in the formulation of your problem as being a source of noise. Um, from my brief time at Akamai, I learned to think of a manager as a source of noise. Um, <laughs> sorry, Shonghua was my manager for one point. He, no noise from Shonghua. But, um, no, you know, they, they, they put constraints on your problems, they change problem formulation, and Usually, though, it's still not designed to conspiratorially put you in the worst case for your algorithm. It's just something arbitrary, but not correlated actually with the algorithm you've tried to design. Um, another way of thinking about this, if you like, is that your ideal problem, if you want, you can think of it as chosen by an adversary. And that's usually when you have a, do you think about worst case analysis of an algorithm, what you're doing is you're measuring the algorithm on an input instance chosen by an adversary. Here we're going to think of the, whatever the adversary chose being affected by randomness. And that, that noise is actually going to alter the way our algorithm behaves. It limits the power of the adversary. So before our work, there was a discrete version of this called the semi-random model by Santa and Vazirani, where they talked about an adversary choosing a problem and then random perturbations of and say Avram did some work on this and Ori did some work on this and there are a number of papers on that model. Um, we're going to think about a discrete, I'm sorry, a continuous model as opposed to a discrete model. So here's one way of formulating it and I'll think for now of just measuring the complexity of an algorithm. So let's think again of algorithms that will take real number inputs. I'll let t of n, or sorry, t of x be the amount of time it takes an algorithm to run on an input x. So then the complexity function that is the complexity on inputs of length n is of course the maximum over all inputs of length n of the running time. We often do average case analysis where we're measuring the expected running time over some distribution of random inputs. And here I have labeled the random thing g because I'm going to think of what's a good distribution on random numbers or Gaussian random variables or something like that. That's what I prefer. So we're going to make a hybrid of them that we call smoothed complexity. So it's going to have two parameters in it, as opposed to just one parameter. One parameter will be input length. Another parameter will be a measure of the amount of noise we have. So we'll talk about, say, the smooth complexity of an algorithm is parameterized by the input length and the amount of noise. You can think of it as the maximum over input instances of the expectation under slight random perturbations of those instances. So here I've added x to, if you'll excuse me, something multiplied by g. I say the excuse me, it's a longer formula than I'd want. There's a sigma there telling you what's the standard deviation of your Gaussian. And I've also multiplied by the norm of x because at least for the algorithms and problems I'm going to consider today, you usually want to perturb things by a perturbation proportional to their magnitude. Or another way of putting it, if I multiply through by 10, everything should stay the same. So I like to think of perturbations as being proportional to the size of the input. You are free to choose other models. This is the one that will make sense for the problems we'll look at today. Okay, so to explain the pictures that were on the start of my slide, oops, I lost one mic. Oh. 
there are two. Oh. Give you a hand there. Thank you. It's got a red light. Okay. <laughs> okay, so when you're measuring the worst case complexity of, of an algorithm, it's measuring the highest peak in a graph like this. And this is our sort of picture of an algorithm whose worst case complexity is going to be much worse than what you might see in a typical example. Now what do I mean by typical? Well, average case is just the average of this plot, which is down here. But really what I'm focusing on is that these worst case examples are sort of isolated in this picture. Or maybe think of them living on a low dimensional manifold or near a low dimensional manifold, but not too bad. So when we measure smooth complexity, we take this function, and here what we've done is we've convolved it with a Gaussian. That means locally average things together. And you see that when we measure smooth complexity, we're then measuring the highest peak in this smooth version of the complexity landscape. And at least if your bad examples, or the examples in which the complexity was very high, were sort of isolated or sort of looked like they had some low dimensional manifold structure to them, then the smooth complexity will be much lower. If, on the other hand, you did have some big plateau that was very flat at the top, the edges will drop off a little bit, but the top would still be there. Okay, so of course you don't just have to do smoothing on running time. You can do smoothing on any performance measure of an algorithm. Uh, we'll take a look at things like, uh, you could think about what is the accuracy of the solution returned, how many bits of precision do you need to carry around in order to get an answer, what's the probability of success, all sorts of things you could measure. One thing we have found is that there are many algorithms that do poorly in the worst case. They have funny bad examples that people from experience know perform well in practice. And at least for a fair number of them, people have now shown that they have good smooth performance. So that their smooth analyses get you out of this worst case and come closer to what people actually observe. Okay, so for the outline of my talk, I want to begin just talking about what perturbations do to inputs to algorithms. Just to understand generally what can happen. And then we'll talk about the condition number, which is really a way of measuring how much effect perturbations can have, but it's much more than that. Uh, the condition number is also an instance-based measure of the complexity of an algorithmic task. Or let's say it has been observed to be one. And that fits very nicely with some of the talks we saw earlier today. And if I'm really quick, I will try to make some connections in my last, at the very end, though they didn't make the end of my slides. Um, and then I'll take a look at just solving a few classical numerical problems. First, just solving systems of linear equations, say by Gaussian elimination. We'll try to understand a little bit what happens when you perturb systems of linear equations and what does smooth complexity tell us there. Um, we'll look at linear inequalities, namely linear programming. I'll tell you a little bit about the simplex method and about interior point methods. I might have a star after the interior point methods because um, simplex method is a great example of something that you can make bad examples for, but it works very well in the worst case. The interior point methods we think are nice because we know they are polynomial time algorithms. But that's not why we use them. The reason we use, because they actually perform better in practice than their worst case analysis would suggest. If you were actually getting, again, the worst case analysis out for interior point methods, you wouldn't be using them. Um, but again, they're usually better. So even though the worst case is polynomial time, they're usually better. This is what happens a lot of algorithms. Finally, I want to finish by talking about polynomial equations and some very new root uh, results of Burgesser and Kuker on showing that you can solve systems of polynomial equations in smooth polynomial time. I'd like to talk about what that means too, because that's a very counterintuitive statement, I think, to many of us. Okay, so first, 
One question I'm often asked is, am I suggesting that to solve a problem, we should first perturb the input and then solve the problem? And my answer is to the first order, no. Because, well, one, when we're doing this smooth analysis, I think it'll make sense for this audience, but we're usually just trying to explain why algorithms succeed. Assuming that there's a little bit of noise in the inputs, you might then be able to explain why an algorithm works. But there's a more fundamental reason I don't just want to take problems and perturb the inputs. Because that can substantially change the answer. There are many problems for which even very, very small changes in the input can produce huge changes in the answer. Now if you've got such a problem, you better be sure that you've measured your input very carefully. <laughs> but if you really want to solve that problem, you're not going to want to perturb it and then solve it. That said, in about 15 minutes I will show you how you can get a better solution to something by perturbing it and solving it. So there are exceptions, but we'll see why. Okay, usually when we want to measure what is the effect of perturbations on the output of an algorithm, we do that in terms of the condition number. Now, Condition numbers are defined two or three different ways in numerical analysis, but my preferred definition is you think about making, I should say there's a, sm think of what happens when you make a small change in the input. And measure under small changes in the input, how much does the output change? Measure it relative to the change in your input. So usually you want to measure how much the output can change when you change the input a little bit. Really I should be taking a derivative here. Really, should be, this should be something like the norm of the gradient, which usually is how much your output can change just a little bit with a small change in the input. So when we talk about a problem being well conditioned, it means that the output does not change too much when the input changes a little bit. And we can, of course, you know, quantify that, but I will usually in this talk try not to quantify things. I'll just say well conditioned, meaning the output doesn't change too much. Okay, so here's one observation that we find almost throughout smooth analysis. If you randomly pair a problem, you almost always wind up with a well conditioned instance. Meaning if you perturb something and then perturb it by a little bit less, you're usually not changing it too much in the second perturbation. Even though the first random perturbation may have had a big impact. I, I will make this concrete in many cases, but this is just one sort of thing to be aware of. I'm sorry to be starting my talk with smoothed analysis really with a caveat or a warning. But it is that to some degree when we are talking about looking at inputs being perturbed, we are usually assuming then that our input instances are relatively well behaved or are well conditioned. But that's where I want to start. Okay, so another thing to observe about these condition numbers, they are a lower bound on the number of bits of precision you need just in your input if you're going to solve a problem. And of course if you measured your inputs to less resolution than the condition number. That means you have not measured them to enough bits of accuracy to actually you know, get the answer you want. So numerical analysts often talk about the condition number as a measure of the complexity of an algorithm. Because there's a lot of algorithms from numerical analysis whose running time is proportional to the condition number or the log of the condition number or something like that. But they use it as a measure of the complexity just in addition to input size. It's fundamental to many smoothed analyses also. So it's going to pop up in each of the examples I will give you today. So because I think of the condition numbers being so important, I want to try to give everyone now an intuitive understanding of it and then we'll try to make it a little more precise. So to get an intuitive understanding of it, let's just think about solving systems of linear equations. I give you A, I give you B, and I ask for X such that AX equals B. So of course the first way of understanding this is what you're doing is you're solving many equations at once. You're writing AI X is equal to B where AI is a row of A and you get that for every single row. So here's an example where what I've done is I've drawn the AIs for you as two points at 1, 0, and 0, 1. And when you're solving the system of linear equations, each linear equation says that X has to lie on some hyperplane in 2D. Thankfully hyperplanes are lines, I can draw them. And you see X is the intersection point of those. This is a very well conditioned example. If you change the BIs a little bit, X just moves a little bit. And even if you change the XIs or the entries of this matrix a little bit, it will rotate these lines slightly, but X will not move too much. So this is a wonderfully conditioned example. 
Let's look at a poorly conditioned example. So in this case, I've tried to draw two points that are almost uh, the same line. Here's the origin, but not exactly. In this case, you can see if these two lines make a sharp angle with each other, then for one thing, slight changes in the BIs, which tell you how far out this line should be, will move the point X a lot. And similarly, slight changes in the angles between these two lines will move the point X a lot. Okay, now in 2D, this is really the only sort of example of an ill-conditioned system of linear equations I can give you. Let's try 3D, by which I think I'm going to need some visual aids. We'll see how this works, and maybe some uh, believing or imagination. So the first thing to note again is each constraint tells you, gives you a hyperplane on which the point X has to lie, and also each constraint is orthogonal to this vector AI. So when I have a system like this here, the way to think about it is what I've done is I've taken points in a tr uh, the corners of an equilateral triangle centered at the origin. And those are my normals, except I just lift it away from the origin a little bit. So what that gives me is that gives me three planes that point up in a very sharp pyramid, you should imagine. That's what this example would correspond to if the Bs were all one. So it's like you have three points in a very, very sharp spiky pyramid. That's sort of the analog of the example I had on the previous slide. And if you have that, you move those planes in and out a little bit, the point will zip up and down a lot. Won't move far left to right, but it'll zip up and down in the direction of the pyramid. Okay, this example is a little trickier. The way to picture it, if everyone can see, is I've got two of the planes, maybe that look like my notebook here, opened like this and they're orthogonal to each other. So two things like that that are orthogonal, those are pretty good. The other plane is sort of almost contains the line that's the backbone of my notebook. So if the other plane almost contains that, as I move that plane in or out, the solution can zip either way along the backbone of my notebook. That's the way I try to think about it anyway. So the bottom line is that this thing is really almost in the span of those. So these two don't cause much trouble. But once you add the third one, you become very ill-conditioned. Alternatively, you can think that line that was the backbone of the notebook doesn't move too much with slight changes to these. But the third point of intersection here does move a lot. OK, so you can show that such a system will be poorly conditioned only if one of the points AI lies close to the span of the others. And you think of that as being unlikely. Because the span of the other points is a subspace, or a hyperplane of dimension n minus 1 through the origin. So you think it's unlikely under some reasonable perturbations that some AI would lie near them. That is true under many models of perturbation. Let me show you some. So first, imagine we make Gaussian noise in each variable. Well, okay, so here I drew sort of the probability density of a Gaussian in two dimensions, and a hyperplane then is just a line here. You can say, what's the chance that a Gaussian is near a line? Well, I didn't choose the worst case line. The worst case line would have gone right through the center of the probability distribution. But it's still pretty unlikely if you have a Gaussian distribution. Where unlikely, again, depends on what your variance is. But you're unlikely to be much closer than the standard deviation to the line. Um, another model of perturbation people like, at least when dealing with vectors, is maybe I add a uniform random vector to my vectors of bounded norm. That means like you're choosing, instead of the AIs, your, no, your, no, sorry, your ideal vector is the center of the ball, and your noise is then a random point in the ball. But you can again see if you take a random point in a ball, it's unlikely to be too close to any plane. Because there's a little bit of the ball, this belt, right near the barrier of the plane, but a lot of it lies above it. Um, another model of perturbations people like to make is I add to every single coordinate, like some random number in plus minus epsilon. If I do that, then my actual vector is being chosen from a hypercube. And again, you can show that it's not likely to lie too close to any one plane. Um, there are other models. I'll mention one other studied by Beer and Falking, where they just considered actually any distribution that's not concentrated near any place. So they sort of look at perturbing every single entry of our matrix or choosing it from a probability distribution. They say it's not concentrated anywhere. They upper bound the probability density. 
And that upper bound just acts like an upper bound on standard deviation. You can also under that model show, well, it's basically like the hypercube example, that you're unlikely to lie too close to any one plane. Okay, so in all of these probability distributions, we know that a random vector is unlikely to lie too close to any one plane. You can use that to show that a random matrix is unlikely to be ill-conditioned, or a smooth matrix is unlikely to be ill-conditioned when you perturb by any of these models. You just take a union bound over the n different vectors AI. Now that won't get you the tightest results, but it will get you a result, saying after smoothing you're unlikely to have an ill-conditioned matrix. If you want to get the tightest results, there is a better definition or a better geometric way of understanding ill-conditioning. I'll just mention it comes from the Eckert-Young theorem. It tells you that the condition number is 1 over the distance of your matrix to a singular matrix. So of course if the matrix is singular, if it's, you know, if it's degenerate, then in general there is no solution to your system of linear equations. That's clearly horrible. Alternatively, you can think of singular means that under slight perturbations you can move things obscenely far. You know, between fees existing and not existing of a solution. Well, it turns out the condition number is exactly the reciprocal, well, exactly up, up, sorry, if you scale the condition number. You know, I like to scale things by the magnitude of the matrix. Once you scale, the condition number is the reciprocal of the distance to singularity. Where how do I define distance on matrices? You just treat the matrix as a vector. You know, take the columns and put them in one big vector and take Euclidean distance. Their theorem is that the distance to singularity is equal to the condition number. Um, I should mention that because of this theorem, sometimes people actually define the condition number of a problem to being something like the distance to singularity or the distance, one over the distance to singularity, where you have to define singularity for the appropriate problem. Okay, there's one other definition that we'll exploit. You can also say the condition number is the maximum of the norm of A, which is equal to the maximum over vectors x of the norm of Ax divided by the norm of x. That's how much can A blow up a vector times the norm of A inverse. The norm of A we usually don't worry about it. That's sort of our scaling term. That tells us how big our matrix is. The norm of A inverse tells you if you're trying to solve a system like Ax equals B, how much bigger can x be than B? It's the norm of A inverse B divided by the norm of B. So if the condition number is small or not too big, that means that when you solve systems of equations like Ax equals B, the norm of X won't be too much bigger than B. That's a useful thing to know. So it bounds the magnitude of the solutions you get. Actually, it's interesting that you can only get really large solutions if it is in fact possible in this problem for your solutions to vary a lot when you change the input. Okay, so now I want to take some profit. We now know exactly everything we want about the condition numbers for systems of linear equations. Let's use it to understand Gaussian elimination. I'm going to begin perversely by examining a bad variant of Gaussian elimination, the one that you fail linear algebra if you do not get beyond. It is Gaussian elimination without pivoting. So Gaussian elimination without pivoting. Well, remember Gaussian elimination. You take a matrix, you eliminate row by, use each row to eliminate the other rows. And in Gaussian elimination without pivoting, you always eliminate all the entries in the kth column using the kth rows. That is, you never swap rows. Now, I say, if you never swap rows, there can be a problem. You're, because that, you can get zeros on the diagonal. And you might remember that if you have a zero on the diagonal, you can't use it to eliminate entries below it. Because no matter what you multiply that zero by, it's not going to cancel out anything below. So this is a bad algorithm. Um, on the other hand, if you're doing some perturbations, you never get zero pivots. That's just an event of measure zero, or probability zero. It's not going to happen. So uh, maybe this is a cautionary tale, but Gaussian elimination without pivoting can look okay after perturbation, because you never have zero pivots. So of course you can ask, when do zero pivots actually show up? Uh, usually one on the problems your teachers give you because those all have small integers in them and then those accidentally cancel to give you zeros on the pivots once you have small integers or if you have many zeros in your problems or I'll admit if you're solving a system of linear equations that came from some combinatorial problem it's reasonably likely you're going to get zero pivots somewhere along the way but of course it's combinatorial probably all your entries were one or zero but of course, zero pivots aren't the only problem in Gaussian elimination. Just as bad as zeros are really small numbers. 
I mean, a really small number to a computer is pretty much the same thing as zero, unless you're using arbitrary precision arithmetic. But then you know you're going to need more and more bytes. And you're going to need more and more storage. So actually, Gaussian elimination without pivoting is also bad, just because you can get small pivots. When you get small pivots and you want to eliminate other things with them, it means you have to multiply them by large numbers. When you have to multiply by large numbers, you need to store more bits in order to get an accurate solution. And that comes into the complexity of your algorithm, which is how much precision do you need to store all of the numbers you're dealing with. This, of course, is what we call instability in algorithms, which is how sensitive is your algorithm to round off errors, or you're not storing enough errors. If you only think about doing Gaussian elimination over finite fields, you will never worry about this and you'll be happier. But over real numbers, this becomes an issue. So here's what Gaussian elimination without pivoting looks like. This is the sort of thing that can happen. Your first pivot here is a 1. You use that to cancel the other entries, and I get this matrix. Now my next pivot here was a 1, but when I use that to cancel the 8, I've got to multiply things by 8. I start getting some big numbers. And you can ask, is this a problem? So a few years ago with Arvind Sankar and Shonghua Tang, he said, well, in this moved case, it's not a huge problem. That's the way I will interpret this result. If you have a matrix that's been perturbed, this tells you that as you're doing all these eliminations, the probability you get an entry larger than t, let's say for any number t, is at most some polynomial in n and sigma divided by t. Now, whether or not that's good or bad depends on your perspective. It says, you know, the probability of getting an entry like 10 to the 8th might be 1 over 10 to the 8th. Or, so then why is this a problem for us? Well, one, you don't always, I guess you do keep 10 to the 8th in accuracy. You don't keep 10 to the 14th. Uh, but maybe the problems where this is a problem aren't, say, perturbed. Anyway, let me tell you just quickly how you would prove this, because we're going to prove something better in a moment. The thing is, whatever you're doing, when you're eliminating a row, what happens is, let's say I'm taking a look at this row here. We're doing elimination on it. Or we take a look at what we get after eliminating the previous rows. The only way I get a big entry here is if I use, express this row as a large multiple of the previous rows. That can only happen if they were ill-conditioned. So in some way, the only way you can get large numbers when you're doing Gaussian elimination without pivoting is if one of your principal submatrices, as you grow, happens to be ill-conditioned. And we just proved that it's unlikely that a matrix is ill-conditioned and there are n principal submatrices. You can take a union bound over them. So it's sort of unlikely that you get large entries when you're doing Gaussian elimination, even without pivoting, if you have a perturbed problem. Okay, I do view this as, again, just slightly a negative result for perturbations because we know we don't use this algorithm. But maybe it is that this behavior, that an entry being larger than t is at most 1 over t, is not good enough. Maybe if it were like 2 to the minus t, we would use this algorithm. But 1 over t is not good enough. Okay, so let's look at the algorithm people do use. This is called Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. So this is a greedy heuristic that people use to control the growth of entries when you're doing Gaussian elimination. What you do is you always swap rows. At every iteration, you're going to do a pivot, whether or not there's a zero in your pivot. You always do a swapping to bring the largest entry in a column to the top. So it's greedy. You do a swap in every case. And this is a great example of an algorithm that works in practice, but is known to fail in the worst case. So let's take a look at just what it does. On the same matrix I started out with before, again, at the very first step, there was a 1 in the upper entry, first column. But we don't want that. We want to move a row with an entry of largest absolute value to the top. So we do a pivot. Then we use that to eliminate. Then we do a pivot again, and we use that to eliminate. And when you do that, when you keep moving the largest entry in a column to the top, you swap rows, you control that there aren't too many entries, usually. So this is what people use to the extent that most linear algebra packages do not bother to implement anything else, even though, one, it is known there are examples on which it can fail, and two, doing something that doesn't have this problem will only cost you a factor of two more in time. But that factor of two just does not seem worth saving to people in order to um, you know, avoid this very small probability that your algorithm fails. So let me show you an example of this failing. So I'm going to generate a small matrix, 
for those who don't know the MATLAB, here is what my matrix looks like. I've got ones on the diagonal, minus one below the diagonal, zeros above, and ones on the right-hand side. That is the matrix. Let's generate a random right-hand side vector. This is a vector of Gaussian random variables. And now we can solve. And for those who don't know MATLAB, the way you solve a system of linear equations is I just type something like x is equal to a divided by b. And I get a solution. And is it the right solution? Oh, I lost, uh, let's check. I can do a times x. And I see that I've lost b from the screen, so let me pull that back up. Okay, a times x and b look pretty much the same. Okay, so Gaussian elimination worked. But uh, just to do a comparison better, let's compute the norm of their difference. Okay, the norm of the difference was something like 6 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so x, the sol- x was a, gave me a very good solution. But that was for a 6 by 6 matrix. This is going to fail when we use a bigger matrix. This is because MATLAB is using Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. Let's do the same for 100 by 100. Not a big matrix, by the way, but big enough. Okay, so now I've generated my matrix. I got a random B. I've chosen an X. And with high probability, we will see that A times X is actually very far from B. The norm of A times X minus B was 12. So nothing like 10 to the minus 6. That was big error. Actually, let me point out how bad this is. Let's take a look at the norm of B. The norm of B was 10. So that means had you guessed that X was the all zero vector, you would have gotten the right, a better answer, <laughs> residual error, than the X that MATLAB computed for us using partial pivoting. Okay, they are so unconcerned about this problem that they're not even checking if their code is giving the right answer before they return the answer. Um, by the way, if you want to know how you fix this, there are two ways. One is you always pivot, the, you pivot you pivots on rows and columns. You always move the largest entry in the matrix to be the pivot. And Wilkinson proved bounds on how much growth you get. By the way, it's a, if you, it's a beautiful conjecture that the bounds are much better than Wilkinson proved. Um, if you want something that's actually just a factor of two off in time, you use a QR factorization instead of doing this LU factorization that we're doing, for those who know. But okay, let me show you other interesting features of this example. So one reason this, they can get away with this is these bad examples are very unstable. Let's perturb it a little bit. So let me change my matrix by adding to it a random matrix, Gaussian random entries, divided by 10 to the 8th. So I had integer entries basically, and now I'm going to divide, add random numbers divided by 10 to the 8th. So that will be a very, very, very small perturbation. If we solve then the perturbed system, xp for perturbed, and take a look at the norm of the error, it's about 10 to the minus 14. Okay, so making an obscenely small perturbation to this matrix resulted in very small error in our solution. But we solved a perturbed problem. Okay, this is the only case in which, so far, in which I'm going to suggest perturbing before you solve a problem. Because we also have a good solution to our initial problem. So if I take a look at what's the norm of the error on the original problem, it's 6 times 10 to the minus 7th. So we actually got a good solution to the initial problem by perturbing it and then solving the perturbed problem. The reason the error is like 10 to the minus 7th is we made a perturbation on the order of 10 to the minus 8th. But it's not only that, the initial problem was well conditioned. So making a small perturbation to the initial problem, the amount of error we got when we solved the perturbed problem was about proportional to the magnitude of our perturbation. But it eliminated the problems with the algorithm. Okay, so as I said, I wasn't going to suggest perturbing problems and then solving them. This might be one example where if your Gaussian elimination really fails, it might be a reasonable idea. But let's try to analyze this, which is what I really want to do. So first, let me mention a quote by Nick Trefethen. In writing a paper entitled Three Mysteries of Gaussian Elimination, he said, Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is utterly stable in practice. In 50 years of computing, no matrix problems that excite an an explosive instability are known to have arisen under natural circumstances. Matrices with large growth factors are vanishingly rare in applications. 
So this is you know, his statement from, God, over 20 years ago, if I could get away with this. So here's a theorem that Shonghua Tang and Arvind Sankar and I proved under about partial pivoting. It says the probability that you get an entry larger than t grows like, we've got factors in n in the perturbation, but t to say to the minus order log n. Okay, I would really like that to be about t to the minus n. So far we know about t to the minus log n. Maybe it's log squared n. Um, I'm sorry, the reason you find two dates here is this appeared in Arvind Sankar's thesis and then he went to Goldman Sachs, which is what it was at the time, and wasn't interested in writing the paper, he was interested in, you know, I don't know what he did to it. I don't know if he's responsible for anything. Um, but uh, anyway, but I, I recently found a simplification of our paper, so I'm working on writing it up now. So then hopefully that appears soon. And with the simplification, it's certainly worth writing up. Uh, yes? Is the exponent uh, plus C log n? Oh, oh, I wrote minus. I'm sorry. Oh, no. The, oh, yeah, that should have been plus C log n. Thank you. I, I forgot that double negative is actually a positive. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, right, that should have been plus C log n. But it, probably someone can prove an n there or at least a root n. The best we know is a log n. But at least this is much, much better than the case without pivoting. So this might be some argument for at least we understand in the smooth model Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting is at least much better than without pivoting. And that at least does agree with the fact that you'd want the knowledge that you want to use this algorithm rather than no pivoting. So at least the probability of getting big entries grows very small. Uh, well, when you don't uh -huh. pivot, do you know that the dependence mm -hmm. on t is correct? Yes. Yeah, the dependence on t is correct when we don't pivot. We actually get a pretty fine analysis of that. Okay, so I was going to tell you something about how we prove this. Yeah, I can tell you just a little bit. Um, the basic idea is, let me just tell you for the last row. Actually, the very last row of the matrix, just proving there's no large entry in the last or no large coefficients used to express the last row is the easiest one. It's the middle rows that are hard. Um, for the last row, you can argue when you're doing partial pivoting that the coefficients you use to eliminate the last row grow by at most a factor of two every step in reverse. So the previous row you used with coefficient at most one. The row before that you used with coefficient at most two. The row before that with coefficient at least most four. So basically the last few rows aren't going to have a big impact on the last row. On the other hand, if I look at the first bunch of rows, say rows 1 through n minus k, I'll set k equal to log n, that's a rectangular matrix. And they will only have a big impact on the last row if it, that rectangular matrix is poorly conditioned. But the thing is a rectangular matrix is much less likely to be poorly conditioned than a square matrix. So you're saying if I have a rectangular matrix, say n minus k by n minus 1, you can prove the probability that as condition number worse than t grows actually like t, or it shouldn't have been minus k, 1 over t to the k, or t to the minus k. The reason is, again, the only way this matrix is poorly conditioned is that if some one of its rows in here is close to a linear combination of the other rows, but now there are only n minus k minus 1 other rows, so it's a subspace of co-dimension k. So when you have a rectangular, so it's very unlikely to lie near that. So the key point is when you have a rectangular matrix and you perturb it, it is much less likely to be poorly conditioned than a square matrix. Maybe that's enough of the proof. Why don't I tell you about some other algorithms? Okay, so first, linear programming. Now that we understand linear constraints, we can understand linear programming to some degree. Linear programming is, of course, the problem of things like go as far as you can in some direction, like this way subject to a bunch of linear constraints, so subject to lying within a polytope. And you can now imagine that when you want to perturb a polytope, you'll understand what happens by applying our knowledge of perturbing linear equations. So this was actually the problem that motivated Shang and I to develop smoothed analysis. We're looking at the simplex method, which works by walking along the vertices of the polytope edge by edge. So you use edges of the polytope and you go from vertex to vertex, greedily always trying to get better with respect to the objective function. And, okay, I didn't put our result, was it even, you know, the, the, at least a particular version of the simplex method has polynomial smoothed complexity, even though it's exponential in the worst case. Let me first tell you our intuition for this theorem, not how we proved it. Our intuition was that as the simplex method traverses a corner, some corners are sort of good. There's some corners of the simplex at which you can see, of the polytope, which you can see make a lot of progress. Those are generally the ones for which the linear equations defining them are well conditioned. 
Meaning as long, you know, the angle there is not too flat is another way of thinking about it. When the angle's not too flat, we thought we make a lot of progress. But when you have ill-conditioned corners, they sort of are very unstable and tend to zip off and not appear in your polytope. So that under perturbation, we thought you shouldn't get too many of these nasty ill-conditioned corners. That didn't lead to a proof. Okay, there's a problem with analyzing this algorithm is that it's iterative. Which means that, you know, where you can step next depends on where you were before. And when you have algorithms like that, it's difficult to keep enough randomness in your arguments to be able to reason about anything. Because you might be able to reason about one step, but reasoning about n squared steps away, well, you know, there's no randomness left after you've conditioned on whatever happened in the past. Okay, so we looked at something else. We looked at a homotopy method, which is there's a particular simplex algorithm that's a homotopy method. What I mean by that is you start by considering some objective function, we'll call it C in it. And imagine you know the vertex optimizing one particular objective function. What we will do is transform that objective function into another objective function slowly and keep track of the vertices that maximize all of the transformed objective functions you get along the way. So the reason this is called a homotopy method is because you're slowly transforming the problem from a problem you have solved into a problem you have not, and you are tracking the solutions as you go. It's also a simplex method, and the vertices you encounter are exactly those on the outside of this picture. So at least the advantage of studying such an algorithm is we can reason about it because it's not truly iterative. We know the vertices that we are going to encounter are the vertices that op maximize one of these objective functions. And I can then say probabilistically reason about a vertex maximizing such an objective function and then think about it. That's one reason that homotopy methods actually are analyzed a lot in smooth analysis. I'm going to show you some others. Well, but I guess I should have said one thing you can say. If you take a look at the vertex that optimizes a given objective function, at least for that objective function, you can prove with good probability that the vertex that optimizes some particular objective function is probably well conditioned. Okay, so this brings us to talking about condition numbers for linear programming. So of course, either linear programming should have a condition number. It's actually to some degree related with things we saw earlier today, you can think about it as being related to a property of the optimal solution. Take a look at the actual vertex optimizing this objective function. That vertex being well conditioned is sort of related to the condition number of linear programming. At least you need that to be, or you don't necessarily need it, but if it's well conditioned it sure helps. So, Let's not define it exactly, but let me give you at least one theorem of Renegers, which said that the condition number is, again, inversely proportional to the distance to ill-posedness. Where in here, when they, this is our analog of singularity. What it means for a linear program to be ill-posed is that it's on the boundary of being feasible and infeasible. Meaning you make a slight perturbation, it's feasible one way, slight perturbation the other way, it's infeasible. And you can talk about being primal ill-posed and dual ill-posed. The condition number is whichever one of these is worse. Take one over that. So there's a nice theory here for condition numbers of linear programs. Um, in work with Dunnigan, Shanghua and I showed that at least after a perturbation, it's very unlikely that a linear programming problem is ill-conditioned. So that tells you something about this, another statement along the way. Reniger also proved a very nice theorem, which is that an interior point method converges in time, polynomial, times something logarithmic in the condition number. When I say converges, I mean getting a very, very accurate solution. Actually, to get, say, an epsilon accurate solution, we need to multiply by a log 1 over epsilon, but let's not worry about that. The key point is that the running time of the algorithm takes time depending on the condition number. What I want to point out is that the method is all, this method is also a homotopy method. I mean, there are many variants of interior point methods. Some of them are homotopy methods, some are not. Uh, Renegar's preferred one is. So let me try to briefly explain to you how that works. Okay, the first thing you need to know is that a polytope has a center. There are a couple of different centers. We're going to consider the one here called the analytic center. I drew it as that dot there. The main thing you need to know is you can check if you're at the analytic center. It's easy to compute. Not only that, if you are nearby the analytic center, you can use the Newton's method on the equations that define the analytic center to move closer very quickly. 
So if you are anywhere near it, and I think of nearby as being something like inside that ball, you can very quickly approach the analytic center. It's where Newton's method is quadratically convergent. Okay, so here's an idea then of how you would run an interior point method. First, you find a center of your polytope. And then let's imagine we just add some vacuous plane. This plane does not cut off anything in our polytope. Uh, it actually should probably be drawn further out, and it's orthogonal to the objective function. What we then do is we then move this plane forwards and see how it changes the center. So you shift the plane forwards, compute the new center of the polytope. Each time I move this plane forwards, it changes the center, and you compute the new center. And when you push the plane far enough in, you're actually getting yourself to the objective function to the optimum, the, ver the vertex that optimizes the objective function. So the reason I say this is a homotopy method is what's happening is the centers are actually living along a path. That path um, is characterized by how far you've pushed this plane. So if I, you imagine doing this continuously, the centers would follow out this path. Really what you're doing is you're continuously transforming the problem and solving the, the changed problems at every step. Now, let me tell you how you actually do this. Because you never compute any of these numbers. You just approximate them. So you begin by computing an approximation to the analytic center. Let's not worry about how. Then what you do is when you perturb the problem, that is, change it by moving this plane forwards, what you need is that our approximation to the analytic center lives in the ball of convergence for the analytic center of the new polytope. So the idea is I move this plane not too far. If I move this not too far, ideally the an that my center doesn't move too far, and hopefully the ball of convergence for Newton's method doesn't move too far either. So that I'm, my original point was one where Newton's method will still bring me closer to the new center. Then you apply an iteration or a few of Newton's method, you move closer to the center, and then you move again. So you keep doing that. And eventually that should drive you to the solution Okay, so the main thing you need to know, how many steps this takes, or how quickly you can move this plane, depends upon the radii of these Newton balls. What is the radius of the area where Newton's method is convergent? It turns out that that is related to the condition number of the analytic center, or if you think of the equations defining the analytic center, and related to the, con or there's another perspective where you can view this as being related to the condition number of the linear program, depending on how you scale things. So the better conditioned you are, the quicker you can make progress along this path. Actually, pretty amazing once you know that that's what's going on, that this is an algorithm that works really quickly. So this is what we do. Okay, to finish, I want to talk about solving systems of polynomial equations. So think of having n polynomials and n variables. If you have n equations and n variables, you expect solutions, uh, you expect more than one solution. If they were linear, you get one solution. If they're polynomial equations in degree d, you can get many solutions, and they're not even rational numbers. So what do you mean by a solution? Well, Smale's definition of a solution is it is a point from which, as you apply Newton's method, you get closer and closer to a solution rapidly. So the idea is around any solution, there's a ball within which Newton's method is quadratically convergent. And Smale's notion of an approximate solution is any point within that ball. At least once you've found a point within that ball, you know, you can get as many digits of the solution as you want quickly, and it does uniquely identify the solution. No point is within the ball for two different solutions. So this is what we mean by solving a system of equations and n variables, or polynomial equations. We just want to get a point in the Newton ball around a solution. <clears throat> so if you want to figure out how many solutions you can have, it depends on the degree or the shape of your polynomials, but you can use Bezout's theorem to get a bound. It'll typically be exponential. So there can be many solutions, and we just talk about trying to find one. You know, this is a problem that is really hard in the situation we usually think of it. For example, it's very easy to show it's NP-hard to solve systems of polynomial equations, even with approximate solutions like this. If I want to make sure that each of my variables is 0 or 1, I impose a constraint like this, like xi times 1 minus xi equals 1. That polynomial only has two solutions, xi will be 0 or 1. You can turn clauses into polynomials. So it is an NP-hard problem. On the other hand, 
Burgesser and Kuker proved that it is polynomial smooth complexity. So you're going to wonder what the heck is going on. Well, if you take a look, when you make equations like this, these equations actually, they're very, very special. And if you perturb them, things go crazy. Now what do I mean? If I perturb this, if I change that 1 to a 0.9, not much changes. But if I take a look at the perturbation, that could add influences from other variables or other monomials that are not even present. If your equations were degree, degree 3, then when you perturb it, suddenly you'll have cubic terms here. But the main problem is terms from other monomials. So as far as I can tell, all of the examples that we tend to study in th as theoretical computer science of this problem, at least, are horribly ill-conditioned, where just the slightest change in the problem completely changes the structure of the solutions. Well, one reason we know that is also in, if you're in general position, meaning after a small perturbation, the number of solutions you will have to your system is what Bezu's theorem gives you. And these are not what we find with the sorts of problems that we build. So let me quickly tell you how, oh, yes. So if you have a formula and then you uh, Perturb it. Noise, yes. And then, and then you get this solution. You probably get garbage. Yeah, you probably get something nothing related at all. Because actually, when you take your three set formula, there are a bunch of hidden solutions that aren't appearing, really. And under a slight perturbation, and they have nothing to do with your problem, but things that are sort of. There are, let's put it this way there are solutions to very, very nearby problems that are not solutions to the problem you have. It's very ill-conditioned. Okay, so here's the, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't think of, I mean, this still might be usable for something. Um, maybe I'll mention that at the end. Uh, okay, so here's how Shub and Smale started solving this problem with a homotopy approach. The idea is they suggested we start with a particular set of polynomials, I'll call them Q1 through Qn, and assume I know a root of them, x1 through xn. So remember, Q1 through Qn are polynomials that involve all of these variables. Assume I know one x1 through x and that's the solution to all those equations. They said, why don't I slowly transform q into p? How? Just some naive homotopy. Each qi moves to a pi, maybe linearly. Um, they actually do things projectively, but that's a small detail. The point is, they'll turn q into p and follow the solution as you go. Here, I've sort of drew it in. This is a high dimensional space. The solution's going all over the place. So the idea of course, is we'll use Newton's method. So you start out with at least an approximate solution to the original problem. And then you change the problem a little bit and you hope that your root is still within the Newton ball around the right solution in the changed problem. Then you use Newton's method to move it closer. And you keep going. I guess I didn't put the animations to keep going. But basically, you slowly change the problem. You iterate that with Newton's method to keep coming closer and closer to the solution. You alternate those two operations. You can eventually get the solution. Okay, well, can you, uh, one great thing Smale proved is that if you look at the condition number of the problem, that is for a set of polynomials at Q, at a root X, when you look at that condition number, the condition number of the problem, meaning how much the root can change when I change the polynomials, is proportional to the radius of the Newton ball. So we can understand the radius of the Newton ball by understanding the condition number of the problem we're studying. So the condition number will depend on which root you are examining, but every root does have a condition number. You just look at how much does it move as I change the equations. So that enables you to understand things. That said, Shub and Smale wrote a lot of papers on this. They got somewhere, but not that far. So they actually eventually proved that there does exist a good starting set of polynomials, Q1 through Qn. They didn't know what it was, but they proved it exists. And they proved that this enables the solution at least of random polynomial systems with expected polynomial complexity. So they proved we could solve random systems of polynomial equations from this start. This was improved recently by Beltran and Pardo, who said, well, they said, why don't we start from a random system, any random root of that random system. Now, if I give you a random system of polynomial equations, you are probably not going to quickly find for me a root or a solution to all of them. But they didn't need to do that. They just need to sample from this distribution. Meaning they choose the solution first. They choose a random root, x1 through xn, and then choose a random polynomial system of equations to which that is a solution. And then using that, they could then get a good algorithm. So they showed that you could start from a random root and you could sample this distribution. And then you do a homotopy method and you can solve a random system of equations. 
And the way that worked is if I'm trying to solve a random system of equations, and I started from a random system of equations, those two are random. Any linear combination of them is also random. So every system along the way in your homotopy is random. And then you just need a bound on what is the, you need some bounds on the probability distribution of the condition number of a random system of polynomial equations. And then you integrate that along the path and they got a bound. The way Burgesser and Kuker improved this is as opposed to getting bounds on the condition number of a random system of polynomial equations, they did bounds in the smoothed model. So they said, you give me any system of polynomial equations, if you perturb it a little bit, it is probably well conditioned. And you need bounds that has the right, right form, but once you have those, you can solve any perturbed system of linear equations, because you start with a random one, you move to a perturbed one. Everything along the homotopy has at least as much randomness as the perturbed one, because you could start purely random. And then they are able to show that solving polynomial equations has polynomial smooth complexity. So they can solve this. So this might be good for something. I know it's not good for 3SAT. But there might be some problem out there that you can characterize its solution as a solution to a system of polynomial equations that is robust under perturbation. And then, you know, being able to solve them would be useful. I don't know. But at least it does help explain um, the attitude of some numerical analysts who I met who I thought were incredibly cocky, who thought they could always solve systems of polynomial equations. And I thought, no, you can't. It's NP hard. Well, you know, maybe this explains the difference. In their experience, the systems they had, they could solve. Okay, I should just briefly mention, since I've talked about condition numbers so much, so Burgesser, Kuker, and Lotz also had a paper showing that almost any reasonable condition number is unlikely to be large after perturbation. Let me not dwell on it, just so you know it's there for almost any sort of nice algebraic problem. Okay, so let me finish by asking, is this all reasonable? Or when is smoothed analysis a reasonable thing to do? Uh, briefly stated, I think it's when your noise model is reasonable for the problem you are dealing with. Certainly, if you want to make it more reasonable, use less noise. But more than that, make the noise relate to your problem. For example, if I have a matrix that looks like this, it's a structured matrix. Perturbing the entries on their own is clearly an unreasonable thing to do. The reasonable thing to do is to perturb the free parameters, x, y, and z. And then you can look at it. Generally, if you have one problem that's derived from another, you should be perturbing the problem that's derived from. That gives you a more reasonable model. Um, other things to consider are what, what we might talk about are zero preserving perturbations. It's very natural to perturb real numbers, but should you perturb a zero by adding something small to it? Well, maybe not. So a very reasonable thing to do is only consider perturbing non-zero entries. So here I just threw on this example because often your non-zero entries in a matrix have some pattern. And they come from some discrete structure. You could contemplate perturbing the values of the non-zero entries. You could also contemplate perturbing the discrete structure. So the discrete structure, of course, is something like a graph or a directed graph, in this case of a matrix. You could talk about perturbing that, but you've got to be really careful when you talk about perturbing graphs. So when I perturb the equations defining the faces of a polytope, I get a polytope that looks sort of similar. But when I perturb the edges of a graph, say by deleting random edges or adding random edges, it's not clear to me my perturbed graph really looks like the original. So I think if you're going to define a model for perturbing graphs or perturbing discrete structure, you have to be much more careful because it is very easy to lose structures that you were thinking of and you get a problem that looks incredibly different. So finally to finish, if you take this talk and you think about what can you say about the performance of algorithms, I think it suggests that the condition number is a wonderful way of measuring the performance or predicting the performance of an algorithm. And one of the things we really need are other measures of the performance of an algorithm on an input, really instance-based complexity measures, which of course we saw in at least two of the talks earlier today. So maybe I'm going to suggest titling today's talk session as beyond the condition number rather than just beyond worst case analysis. But we see the condition number is very good at predicting performance of a lot of algorithms on inputs. So it would be nice to get other measures that predict the performance of an algorithm. And I'll stop there. Yes.
So yeah. Uh, do you have any idea what happens um, if you take those three set polynomials mm -hmm. and do a zero preserving perturbation? Ah, uh, if you do a zero preserving perturbation, yeah. Um, you can, if you could solve that approximate problem, you would have solved the original as well. But on the other hand, we're not going to be able to help you solve it. Are there instances yeah. where people are able to analyze zero preserving perturbation? Um, let me think. I'm not sure why there's one. Um, there's only one case that we accidentally be able to prove when the matrix is symmetric. Oh, that's right. There was something about totally right. right. That was Cholesky factorization of symmetric matrices. We were able to do it. That's right. But that was it. Most places it falls apart. Um, for the simplex method, we would really like <coughs> such an analysis and go that one. Okay, Tim. Um, so about interpreting the mm -hmm. actual runtime maps that you get across the analysis mm -hmm. results. So uh, often you get really big problems. Yes. And so, um, so I'm just wondering how literally to interpret quantitative what you, you get. So the one thing we just well, it's not exponential. And uh, the exact word is not relevant. But then you do hear things like simplex is basically linear in practice a lot of the time. So oh, you mean like order and iterations yeah. for it? Yes, that's so, right. So, I mean, do you feel like that's maybe within the realm of analysis? I mean, just be better proof tools, or is it just, or is somehow the smooth analysis guarantee too strong? Oh. Um, those kinds of things be true. In a lot of cases, I think you could get better analyses, but you need to be a better probabilist than I am. Um, thankfully, there's some who are in the business. So if you go to, like, Sean was in my paper on smooth analysis of the simplex method, you should note that Roman Verschinen eliminated about 60 pages of the hardest analysis of that with a really elegant three-page argument. So, I mean, it might just be that with time, people see better ways of doing these things. But also, I still only view the analyses in smooth analysis really as a metaphor. I don't actually really believe this model for most of the inputs I have. I mean, for example, usually when I'm actually solving a linear program, it's not because I'm solving some scientific problem. It's because I'm trying to prove some theorem, and I've got some combinatorial problem going on, and I need to look at the solution of a linear program. And that, that's not perturbed. And so the reason any of these methods works is because it happened to work. So, yeah, I still think, you know, I'd say if you'd like to get better polynomials, I believe better probabilists probably can for a lot of these things. Sometimes you get very sharp bounds. I mean, our bounds for Gaussian elimination without pivoting, as bad as an algorithm it is, are really sharp. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but I still think the bottom line is I view this as more of a metaphor for understanding why something might work. And the exact bounds are probably not critical. You know, the ideal is you get some bounds like this and it might tell you something about why your algorithm is working or not and maybe help you improve it. I mean, it, I still will admit to myself feeling a little bit funny about being in a descriptive venture. I still like to be an engineer. If I'm going to study something and analyze it and understand it, I want that to give me improvement. That's how I actually know I understand it. Uh, I think it's ambitious to hope to improve linear programming. People have worked really hard on that. Other things maybe we could improve. Have there been any successes in the analysis as far as uh, a new algorithm? That's an interesting question. I do not know. Others may know better because there's a lot of papers written on smooth analysis, and I have not had an opportunity to follow nearly all of them. I mean, most of them. The question today? Yes. Um, this is related to the zero. So you were talking mm -hmm. about how so you could try preserving on the, the if you have a problem with saving it. Um, Right, so in your program, you might want to think about the input side. So, mm -hmm. for example, if I have, say, multi-prime flow, yes. I write as LP, it would be natural to say perturb the like, capacities or weights, things like that. But the statement like flowing equals flow out of some mode, I don't want to read the Exactly. Output. You don't want to. That's right. Right. So let me just repeat that. Yeah, if you were doing something like multi-commodity flow, you turn into a linear program. Yes, you might want to perturb costs and <laughs> things like that. But yeah, or, you know, the demands. But you certainly do not want to perturb flow when equals flow out. On the other hand, if you turn that into a polytope, the linear programming problem is already well conditioned, so you can get better results than by just applying naive analyses for interior point methods or something. I have no idea about simplex, but yeah, I absolutely agree.